Oh, welcome back from your lunch break, everyone. There's definitely enough food out there to sink a ship, wasn't there? We just had to get through the crowd to start with, but it was, it was wonderful. And thank you. Someone actually got me lunch, which was very nice. It's almost nicer than the guys at Gallagher that actually provided us with lunch. I hope you're enjoying yourselves today and you're getting a, a great deal out of being able to network and having a chat with those around you about the different uh, propositions that have been put in front of you. A reminder to those of you who are watching wherever you are around Australia internationally that one of the things that we like to do is make our presenters accessible to you. So please jump onto their website, get their contact details and have a chat with them and ask some questions about anything that you see. Because as I said at the start, part of Stewie's vision for this conference is for us to be able to interact. So if there's a reason you haven't been able to get here in person, our presenters would like to speak to you. So take the opportunity to pick up the phone and give them a yell. Right, for those of us in this room here, did you know that there is a publication called The Lawyers Weekly? So many interesting publications for lawyers. I, I just read through a number of them when I was doing research for our first presenter who's coming up here. Mr Newman, would you like to come and join us? This is uh, Jeremy Newman, who is a partner with the fabulous team at Hamilton Lock, who actually put on the most number of partners in the last uh, 12 months, I think it was. So they're expanding rapidly and they've been great supporters of it here at RIU Explorers. And Jeremy's job today is to talk us through the title, What is on the ASX's radar for 2024? And I had a couple of you come up and ask me, what exactly is he gonna talk about? Is it worthwhile coming in to speak, to listen to him? And I said, you bet your bottom dollar it is. He's going to have some inside running. So would you please make Jeremy very welcome, everyone. Thanks for the warm welcome, everyone. And thanks for chairing yourselves away from lunch to come and uh, listen to me speak. So um, today I'm going to run through the six areas that ASX are targeting, primarily in their review of JORC announcements. Um, so first of all, why should you care? Um, my view is if you get the little things right, it improves your rec reputation with investors and the regulator and makes the, the big things easy. And ASX are particularly active in the quiet market. So now that the IPO rush of 2021 is behind us, we can expect an active and interventionist ASX in 2024. <clears throat> These are the areas that I'm gonna run through today. Resource breakdowns, visual estimates, production targets, scoping studies, acquisitions and peer comparisons. <clears throat> First of all, on to resource breakdowns. So this is what they look like, and generally they're included in announcements that uh, refer to the, um, the resources of a company. ASX expects these breakdowns to be in every publication of a publicly reported resource, um, e even in advertising. Um, so this is probably a sore point for many uh, people in the audience because last year ASX went through our IAU's investor pack and required clarifications from each of the issuers who had aggregated statements of mineral resources or oil reserves in their advertising materials. Um, <clears throat> the only exception to providing a breakdown is where it's a, stated as an inferred or indicated resource and there's nothing else in the, in the resource table. So what's the best way to avoid being picked up for a breach of this rule? We suggest including a JORC breakdown in the about section of the end, end of each of your ASX announcements so that you can set and forget. Um, <clears throat> similarly, companies can include notes in their media packs stating that the resource break, resources should not be disclosed without the breakdown being provided. Um, a, a very hot topic for 2023 was visual estimations. So ASX are generally skeptical of expiration results that are obtained purely from a visual inspection of a drill core or a rock chip sample, which are announced before the assay results are obtained. This practice is known as visual estimation. Originally, ASX seemed to perceive visual estimation as solely the practice of identifying the percentage composition of target minerals in the drill core intersection. However, over the last few years, we've seen this interpretation broaden to the point where ASX have been pulling up companies for releasing visual, visual estimates on mineral abundance on not only photos of drill core, photos of rock chip samples, but even on satellite images of pegmatites, commentary on the nature of pegmatites, or the number of rocks observed during a ground reconnaissance program. We've even seen uh, ASX pull up general statements about prospectivity of ground. 
<clears throat> so how did we get here? Um, how did we get to the point where ASX are requiring such fulsome jaw reporting of such innocuous information? First of all, companies' dis continuous disclosure obligation require the immediate disclosure of information that a reasonable person would expect to have a material effect on the value of the entity's securities. However, ASX guidance cautions against releasing visual estimates because the estimates themselves can contain unreliable information. Despite this, market practice over the last few years has trended towards providing visual estimates to increase news flow. This practice led companies, to, particularly in the lithium sector, to feel market pressure to disclose pegmatites cited during pro project gram uh, reconnaissance. ASX has long sought to regulate visual estimates by applying, applying AIG's guidance, um, a, a photo of which we can see on the right here, on the left, sorry. Following this guidance, companies reporting the visual occurrences are required to state the coordinates of the visual estimate, the description of the lithology, the estimation of the mineral abundance, the deleterious elements present, and when the assays will be ready. This is coupled with a cautionary statement on the, when, about not relying on the results until the assays are ready. This event eventually manifests in an ASX compliance update on visual estimates, which codifies the practice today. However, the AIG guidance, as we can see here, with their circles of uh, drill core, was designed at picking up estimations of sulfides in drill core. However, while the AIG guidance works quite well for estimating sulfides in drill core with a finite perimeter, it becomes quite absurd when the sample size is not fixed. For example, estimating the abundance of spodumene in in situ pegmatite the percentage of identified mineral becomes arbitrary based on where you draw the lines around the sample. The introduction of the compliance update didn't quash the practice either. Instead, by codifying it, it solidified the practice into an industry norm. And for the past few years, we've all been spending our time drawing imaginary lines around the photos of pegmatites, all in the name of good disclosure. However, the codif codification has led to alignment on how visual estimates should be reported, which includes identifying the mineral observed and providing an estimation of its in abundance, no matter how it's located, stating the anticipated timing of the assay results and providing a CP statement, uh, sign off in JORP tables one and two. However, the codification hasn't necessarily led to better compliance. As you can see, the number of identified breaches has climbed steadily over the past few years, and it's an area that continues to be a focus for ASX. So what are the key takeaways? Be aware of the increased scope of what constitutes a visual estimate, no matter how absurd. If confident, report them in accordance with the ASX compliance guide, and if not, seek advice on how to do so. Next um, is production targets. And while we haven't seen any evolution in the rules around production targets over the past few years, we continue to see issuers being pulled up for statements akin to production targets. As a starting rule, all production targets should be derived from an economic study and should be based on a majority of indicated or measured resources. ASX will closely examine any production target containing more than 30% inferred resources, and we consistently see market intervention for studies that comprise 50% or more inferred resources. There is no written guidance on the correct percentage. However, if you look at scoping studies over the past 10 or so years, you'll notice that there is a convergence of studies with inferred resources at or just lower than 30%. ASX expect any reference to tonnages or ounces per annum to be expressed as a production target. Similarly, whittle optimizations or other expressions of mining output are generally seen by ASX as a de facto uh, production target. Um, and we've included a sanitized uh, version of a recent retraction for a company that had that same problem with ASX. Um, we generally see ASX consider plant capacity, properly constructed offtake agreements, and in the case of producers, near-term production guidance as items that are factual and not a production target. However, as with any disclosure practice, the entities that seek to exploit these loopholes, for example, by disclosing aspirational non-binding offtake agreements 
or plant capacity that also contains references to potential recoveries may well find themselves gaining ASX's unwanted attention. How then, having to avoid having to retract de facto production targets, companies should be aware of what information could be construed as a production target and either report these figures in line with the listing rules or remove the relevant statements from the announcement. Scoping studies is a perennial topic of interest for both ASX and ASIC. ASX are again focusing on funding assumptions in scoping studies. In particular, with the softening market and falling share prices for many developers, we've seen ASX pay increased attention on the difference between market cap and project capex. In instances where the gap is large, for example, 10 times or greater, we've seen ASX ask for increasingly robust funding assumptions in order to demonstrate a proponent has a reasonable basis for believing it can procure financing. Gone are the days where simply stating the project will be funded with a mix of debt and equity will pass muster with ASX. Another common issue ASX picks up is where an individual assumption is adjusted without revisiting all of the assumptions in a study. For example, if a uranium developer wished to update its old PFS to capture a higher price environment, ASX would prevent it from simply adjusting the price assumption in an old study without revisiting all of the other assumptions, such as operating costs and other modifying factors in the PFS. We continue to see a large amount of regulator intervention in scoping studies. And we strongly suggest seeking advice on these announcements early so, as the time to, so there is time to amend any assumptions that may be red flags for regulators. These are not studies to be sent to your legal advisor the night before a proposed release. However, don't let that stop you if you want to. <laughs> um, acquisitions. So 12 years after Jork 2012 was published, issuers are still wrangling with the best way to satisfy their continuous disclosure obligations, which requires immediate reporting of material information, and their obligations under Jork, which requires significant diligence or comprehensive Jork reporting on the underlying assets. We've prepared a quick cheat sheet here um, which shows some of the most common market practices. So when acquiring a project with only expiration results, we generally recommend releasing the results as if the acquiring entity were announcing those results themselves for the first time. When acquiring a project with an existing JORC 2012 resource, we recommend either reporting the mineral resource as if the acquirer were reporting it themselves for the first time, or using the ASX FAQs to report the vendor's JORC information. This is usually done with the consent of the existing uh, competent person. For pre jork 2012, we recommend using the ASX FAQ reporting methodology. And for all reserves, we recommend reporting only the underlying mineral assets without reporting the ore reserves, um, which would be reported with a new feasibility study. <clears throat> On to peer comparisons. So this is a, quite a common one for ASX to pick up, um, particularly in investor presentations. So ASX considers the reporting of peer comparisons to be potentially misleading, particularly when a, a junior with a project of only inferred resources compares their project to an existing operation or something with dis or a project with disclosed reserves. Um, to counter this practice and the practice of misleading peer comparisons generally, ASX has a very strict reporting regime, which requires individual referencing of comparative projects and a requirement that the comparative project information is sourced from a primary source, e.g. an ASX publication of a feasibility study by the compared company. While there are many examples of correctly reported peer comparisons, entities should be aware that these can require rigorous, rigorous disclosure to release correctly. So what to do? Make sure you're reporting apples with apples and only comparing your project to the market peers. And secondly, add an appendix at the back of the investor presentation with all of the primary source material. Um, this slide almost speaks for itself. Um, but finally, a gentle reminder to proofread your jork tables. There's a common misperception that no one reads the jork tables. However, when a company's true gold is found not in their tenure, but in the JORC tables themselves, 
can be sure that there'll be a million eyes on it. Is there anyone in the room from Great Boulder Resources? Good, there we go. Um, so thank you everyone for listening to me rabbit on. If you have any queries, please come up and have a chat. I'd love to speak with you. Thank you very much. Well done, Jeremy Newman. That was very entertaining. I love it. We saw that during the week and we were wondering if we would make a show here at the, uh, at the conference. So good on you for finding a way of putting that bag of dicks into the place. There we go, right here. Uh, up next, Blackstone Mineral, Scott Williamson is the MD. And Scotty, can you perhaps during the course of this discussion today, enlighten us to why when we got our first coffee at 10 o'clock, your share price was here, and now it's here, because we can't see what's happened, but hopefully you'll tell us a little bit more. Can you make Scott very welcome, everyone? We're talking Blackstone Minerals. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Chrissy. Um, yeah, I'm not sure about the share price. Maybe anticipation of my speech, or maybe I'm going to talk about bag of, bag of dicks or something. But um, no, today we'll be talking about building a global nickel mining and refining business. And you can see there is a, a, a schematic of our refinery we'll be building in northern Vietnam. That refinery will take nickel products from around the world and from our nickel mine in Vietnam, and it will convert them into the chemical products required for the lithium ion battery. So you can see here, we're well located in the Northern Vietnam region, just to the west of Hanoi, and it will be a mine and refinery. It's a previously operating nickel mine. So they operated between 2013 and 2016. We came in about uh, five or so years ago and we just went to town on the drilling. Um, unfortunately, we're not an explorer anymore, but we did over 130,000 metres of diamond drilling over in Vietnam. And we defined a resource in, in the order of half a million tonnes of nickel at about 0.4% nickel, and this is in the sulphide form. Fairly similar grades to the Mount Keith nickel mine in Western Australia. Uh, we also have copper, cobalt, and all the, the platinum group metals as byproducts, and we will be building a a large open pit with a, a low strip ratio of around three to one. We do have some small underground mines, which are similar to the underground mine that was previously depleted. Um, but most importantly, we have abundant hydropower, which drives a very low power cost and um, very strong ESG and green credentials. The refinery is where we will bring imported feedstock from uh, Australia and Canada and around the world, bring it into Vietnam and upgrade it because we think it's a great place to be operating because of that abundant renewable power and the very competitive labour costs. So the refinery will spit out over 40,000 tonnes per annum of nickel. This will be one of the largest nickel refineries in the world and it will produce the precursor cathode active material. It's a chemical product with nickel, cobalt and manganese in a ratio of 811. And that is important for long range in the electric vehicle. So if you want to buy an electric vehicle and you want to be able to get down to Margaret River, then make sure you've got some nickel in your battery. And, um, and, and that's, uh, that's really what's driving this, this demand for nickel in batteries. So it's a vertically integrated business model. Uh, we are looking for partners. This is a major project. It will require a partnership. Uh, we are looking for partners, particularly out of South Korea, Japan, China. We've also starting to include the Vietnamese local conglomerates as well into that process. We've just brought in the experts from Jefferies and Cutfield Freeman and Co. Uh, that uh, CF and Co are an, a boutique advisory group out of uh, London. Jefferies is one of the largest US investment banks. So we've got some of the, the uh, finance experts in to run that process. Until now, we've been running that process ourselves. Um, nothing better than bringing in the experts to make sure that that process comes out with an outcome which is in the best interest of the shareholders. So you can see here, half of our feed will come from the previously operating Banfolk Nickel Mine or the Tarkwa Nickel Project. The other half will most likely come from the Waboden Nickel Project, which we recently announced an option to acquire a previously operating nickel mine in Manitoba. 
In Manitoba, they, we have around 1.3 million tonnes of nickel at a higher grade than we have in Vietnam. So in some ways, I'd say we're, we're upgrading our resource uh, with this acquisition or option to acquire and uh, really excited about that announcement late last year. Um, so half of our feed will come from imported feedstocks. We also have strategic investments in NICO, uh, Corazon and Flying Nickel, and they are potential feedstocks into the refinery. The refinery is where we convert the concentrate or the MHP or other intermediate products into the NCM811, which is the nickel, cobalt, manganese, PCAM, precursor cathode active material. So we acquired, well, option, we have the option to acquire the Manitoba um, asset called Waboden. We have an interest in uh, Corazon, which is listed on the ASX. Uh, they own the Lynn Lake uh, uh, project in Manitoba. Monago, we also have an interest in Flying Nickel, which is on the TSX. So we like Manitoba, particularly because of the type of nickel sulphide, very similar to what we have in Vietnam. We, we believe that the Thompson Belt is one of the most underexplored nickel belts in the world. It's the fifth largest nickel belt in the world, and we think it's the most underexplored. That's why we're building a Manitoba hub, and that Manitoba hub will feed into our Takwa refinery in Vietnam. So just a closer look at Vietnam. So we have uh, three ore bodies um, other than our main ore body. Our main ore body is the Ban Phuc, which was the previously operated underground mine. The previous owners left behind a very large disseminated nickel sulphide ore body, um, which we drilled out. So that has around 450,000 tonnes of nickel in the one ore body in one big open pit. Then we've got some small high grade undergrounds at Ban Chang and King Snake. They're more like your Cambalda style high grade narrow vein massive sulphide. So we've got both types of mineralisation, massive sulphide and disseminated, but we particularly like disseminated because it brings security of supply for our downstream refinery and our, our future partners. So we particularly uh, focused on large scale disseminated sulphides, open pit and or underground. And that's why we, we particularly like um, the Takwa project and also now the Waboden nickel project in Manitoba. So Waboden has a very similar history to Ban Phuc. It operated between 2009 and 2012. The other reason we like Manitoba, it has abundant hydroelectric power. The power cost is even lower than in Vietnam. So less than four cents per kilowatt hour for power. So one of the problems the Australian nickel mining industry has is the power costs. If you, if you can drive your power costs as low as what we've got, you will be operating at today's nickel prices. So we've got this um, abundant renewable power in, in the Manitoba region. We've got a previously operating nickel mine. We've got a concentrator. We've got a near-term cash flow opportunity. If we wanted to, we could turn this on very quickly and be in, into production. It is a fully permitted uh, concentrator that we could turn on very quickly. We've got potential for a large opportunity at Bucko and Bowden. You can see um, a significant amount of nickel sits in those two deposits. These are large scale um, potential open pits or underground, similar to the Mount Keith nickel mine in Western Australia. So we particularly like these big ore bodies because they can drive long mine lives and security supply for our refinery. Okay, next slide. There we go. So these are all of the undeveloped nickel sulphide deposits left in the world today. You can see there's some very large ore bodies. Unfortunately, the larger ore bodies have lower grade. We particularly like the medium grade range because they still are large enough to give you multiple decades of mine life, but they don't give you multiple billions of dollars of capital. So those bigger uh, uh, bubbles to the right of screen are very large disseminated nickel sulphide bodies, which will need very large capital. Our ore bodies that we have our foot on here in the coloured um, middle section are large enough to give us security of supply over decades for our refinery, 
but not with the billion dollar plus capital requirement. So we, we want to be in the sweet spot. We want enough line life so that we can feed the refinery for multiple decades, but we don't want to blow the capital out as well. So we particularly like that grade range between 0.3 and 1%. And a lot of you would say, well, why don't you go for the plus 1%? Well, as you can see, those high grade ore bodies are small and they don't give you the um, production profile that you need to build a refinery. So ideally we want the big um, bubbles up above 1%, um, but they unfortunately are very rare and very hard to find. So you can see these are the only undeveloped nickel sulphide projects left outside of the majors um, so I would um, yeah so there may be some others that are outside of, of this that are sitting in BHP but um, this is all of the uh, undeveloped projects outside of BHP and Russia sorry as well okay so you can see here I've we've got the uh, cost curve for nickel sulfate. So nickel sulfate being the battery grade form of nickel, the chemical um, product, today's spot price. So you can see over half of the industry is underwater at today's nickel price. You can see at the Tarkwa refinery with feed from our Tarkwa mine, we will be in production today. We are not shutting down at today's nickel price. We are very happy operating at today's nickel price. And that is driven by the abundant renewable hydropower and the very competitive and very skilled and very hardworking uh, local uh, workforce that we have in Vietnam. So you can see here the, Viet, uh, the Vietnamese uh, refinery, well positioned in the first quartile and uh, very competitive compared to Indonesia. So everyone's worried about all this supply in Indonesia. We're not worried about it. And the reason is, because we have the ESG credentials that they don't. Everyone's heard of what's happening in Indonesia. It's not a good story for our industry. I won't go too much into that, but you can say that our ESG credentials are significantly better. We have done a life cycle analysis of our CO2 footprint uh, using a group called Minviro. Uh, our number was 9.8 kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of the PCAM product. We believe we can get that to down to 1.4. And the, the couple of ways we can do that is we can bring the sulphide concentrate from Woboden, which has the hydropower. If we have a renewable power um, purchase agreement with the hydro or um, uh, renewable power providers, which we recently announced an MOU with Limes, which is building a wind farm near the refinery. So we, we are on our way to net zero from day one. Our peers in Indonesia have two to six times the CO2 footprint, and we won't go into all of the other things that they're doing wrong, but CO2 is something that they've got a lot of work to do to, to any, get anywhere near where we're going to be um, producing our products. And this is becoming very important for the car manufacturers, particularly the premium brands in Europe, the Mercedes, the, the, uh, the Porsche, the Mercedes, the BMWs, they are already putting threshold limits on CO2 footprint of the metals that are going into their vehicles. So just in summary, the Takwa Nickel Project, we've defined half a million tonnes of nickel in one large open pit. The Woboden Project, we have an option to acquire that has 1.3 million tonnes of nickel. We have ownership in Lynn Lake and Monago together. They have uh, 600,000 tonnes at Monago, 170,000 tonnes at Lynn Lake. So we have access to over 2.5 million tonnes of nickel to go into our refinery and that will feed the refinery for multiple decades. On top of that, we will bring in third party feed. Um, we have the flexibility to bring in mixed hydroxide precipitate, which is a product from nickel laterites, uh, third party concentrates from Australia, for example. Uh, anything that's potentially not suitable for a smelter, we can bring into this refinery. It's a very flexible flow sheet, high arsenic, high MGO, not an issue for our pressure oxidation process, nickel mat also. So it's a very flexible hydromet flow ship, which is tailored to produce these chemical products 
for the lithium-ion battery. The problem we have is that the industry is trying to retrofit dirty, tired infrastructure. We have a blank canvas and we're producing a refinery for those chemical products. So in summary, it's a vertically integrated mining and refining business using hydroelectric power. It will have the strongest ESG and green credentials in the industry, a first quartile cost position with one of the lowest carbon footprints, and we're currently running a partnership process that will unlock the value and we will no longer be priced like an explorer, we will be priced like a developer producer like we should be. So even though we are here at the Explorers Conference and our price looks like an explorer, go back and have a look at our studies, uh, our numbers should be a lot higher. So thank you very much. Thank you, Scott Williamson. Wickapan in our state's wheat belt. It's been famous for two things over the year. First one, birthplace of Albert Facey, the author of A Fortunate Life. And the second thing, in spring every year, it comes alive with some beautiful wildflowers. And now it can add a third string to its bow to boast about because it is the home to the largest known primary kaolin deposit in the world. So to expand on its latest claim to fame, would you please welcome Mr. Alf Baker. Alf, welcome. I'm not sure where my notes are. Oh, thank you. Good afternoon, all. Firstly, I want to thank our shareholders and supporters that have uh, travelled the journey with us over the last few years. And as you can see in the short video, uh, we too are not quite an explorer anymore. In fact, the ex exploration largely was done by Rio Tinto in the earlier years. As a principal founder of this company, uh, <clears throat> with lots of skin in the game, I plan to give you a minimal outline of the history uh, and focus on the status of the company today. This is the short video of our operation at Wikipin uh, on startup. So a fairly small loader in those days, but that's what we started with. I'll continue to speak as that goes, as long as it doesn't shut it down. It did. <laughs> we'll come back to that. Following the usual disclosures, ladies and gentlemen, this is a corporate snapshot showing a considerable erosion in our share price today. And I think that that's uh, mostly due to the fact that our shareholders and the industry was looking for us to uh, break through to our nameplate capacity sooner than we have and uh, possibly due to some irresponsible uh, press where we were said to be struggling under the load of debt. Now that's, that's not right, I don't want to labour that point, but the debt in the company belongs to the founders, mostly at 0% interest. That's skin in the game too. Um, we have about $3 million in the bank and we're ramping up production steadily. Uh, and I've come back from not semi-retirement, but being half-time in my 75th year to uh, take the helm of the operations. Um, you know, a small industrial min minerals business certainly takes a bit of determination and, and uh, and patience to get up and running. I'm pleased to say that it is running. It's running sweetly after a, a shutdown period over the Christmas New Year break. <clears throat> I think I, in particular, will need three things to be successful. And I, I'd say God-given strength is one. Uh, great support from the team and our supporters 
and fresh determination. And I think I've got those three. On the history side, yes, we acquired the resources from Rio Tinto, <clears throat> who carried out major exploration in the region. And I travelled the world of Kaolin uh, after successfully bidding for the resource to make sure that the product, the kaolin, the resource and products refined from it were worthy of investment in production. Uh, without exception, those parties endorsed the resource and endorsed the product that came out of it, such that we, as private people, invested some 40 million dollars uh, to build, to buy the land, to further uh, assess the resource and to build pilot facilities. And you could say more skin in the game, for sure. The ore reserve, uh, and I hope it complies to the legal requirements <laughs> after, after the previous speaker, thank you. Uh, is is vast and uh, extraordinary compared to global competitors. As summarised in that previous slide and detailed in the CSA Global Report, we have enough ore reserve estimate for over 70 years of mine life and hundreds of years if you look at it on the inferred basis. Now, in terms of production progress reporting, uh, without excusing ourselves in any way, most industrial minerals projects go through some pain on startup, and we're no exception. Um, we completed construction under budget and almost in time on time, considering COVID. But it's fair to say we underestimated the time and the cost to, to commission and graduate into full production. Um, one of those things that affect that is that each of our customers is a trophy that only uh, can be exhibited after almost two years, where we start with a kilo, a tonne, maybe one container, 10 containers and long-term contracts. So we, we kind of underestimated how long this all takes. I'm sure it can resonate with some of you. Over the shutdown, I mentioned, yes, we improved the process and, and the plant and sales are growing steadily as we speak and one of the largest fiberglass companies in China have just given us their first order of 600 tonnes. We've needed to learn the finer points of our customers' specification requirements and uh, we have an active R&D program at our Quinana facility where we're developing engineered clay products for the ceramics industry and the paint industry. At the moment, we're limited in those two markets, but to reach our goals of being a global player, we need to be participants in those markets. A couple of pictures of uh, our processing facility. Uh, as you can see, there's a, a large amount of infrastructure gone in at Wickapin, uh, alongside the mine. And the mine itself is just uh, undergoing a campaign for extracting another 140,000 tonnes. And at the end of January, almost 50% of that is on the ground next to the plant. The close up shows something that you may already know, and that is that this resource only has about a four metre of gravel overburden 
and um, <clears throat> some eight meters up to eight meters of mottled what we call mottled clay and then high purity kale and all the way down to 25 or 35 meters these things have been well aired before a few more pictures for you uh, we package our product in bulk bags and super sacks 1200 up to 1200 kilos and also 20 kg bags for the smaller end of the market and you can see our outbound product happening on a daily basis I think today six containers went out so looking ahead action has been taken to shore up the company uh, in terms of management technology and additional equipment to improve both yield and efficiency and stronger management of the plant will impact on uh, on both production efficiency and cost control and stronger management in the marketplace will solidify and expand our customer relations this slide i'll skip over it shows that where we started in a pilot on a pilot basis proof of concept and where we are today and our aspirations and uh, if you'd like me to wind up now thank you again everybody thank you cheers thank you very much sir all right leave them wanting more so if you're finding yourself rushing towards the end of your presentations team leave them wanting more and invite them out to your booth that's where you can make that conversion and make them true believers in what you're doing all right we are going where are we going to get to now we are going to go to oh you know not from uh, azures not far from azures and over i believe it's a long strike we have this next little proposition for you. So the company grounds of Green Tech Metals, and as they leap onto the stage today, full of optimism, I would say, given what uh, they've recently revealed to people. This is Thomas Redicliffe. He is the company ED, and he's our guide today to what is unfolding currently at Green Tech Metals. Please make him very welcome. Uh, thank you, Chris. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll be giving you a short overview of Green Tech and its projects, particularly our uh, lithium projects in the West Pilbara. But firstly, we'll give you uh, a quick snapshot of the company. And you can see they were listed barely two years ago, uh, January 2022. Our focus has become very clearly the West Pilbara area, where we have some 225 square kilometres of tenure. You can see there we've got um, two significant uh, projects there in the lithium space, uh, Kobe 100% owned and uh, the Osborne JV in partnership with Artemis Resources and uh, they're in adjoining tenements as you can see up on here, the blue one's the JV ground, that's the 100% uh, green tech ground and um, those were discoveries uh, about seven months ago. One of our flagship projects, of course, is the uh, Wandu project uh, from uh, when we floated, and it's about 40 k south of Karatha, and um, it's a current resource of some 6 million tonnes at 1% copper and another 1% zinc. So just quickly on the company, today we're trading at around 20 cents, and uh, we've got quite a volatile stock. A uh, big peak there when we discovered lithium on our tenements. We still uh, have a modest market cap there, 16, 17 million. Uh, we still have plenty of cash in the tin at the moment and uh, to go forward from $3 million. And uh, there's the uh, team below there, directors and management. Um, that's uh, running, the, running the show. Now, just when we look at the uh, West Pilbara area, it's quite an interesting uh, place at the moment. Uh, not much parking space. The uh, quite a number of companies. Our tenements uh, are on the end there, and you can see they're all based on the discoveries. Well, really triggered by the, the discovery by, by Azure of their lithium uh, pegmatites at Andover, and uh, which are up this end, and the. Um, then pushed along, I guess, by everybody else in in the area there, um, particularly the uh, some of the newcomers, there uh, uh, accelerate 
found some lithium pegmatites over here. We've got Raiden picked up, found, uh, discovered lithium pegmatites further south, pretty, about eight kilometres so south of Azua. And even uh, Irrawarra picked up an extension to that discovery. And of course, more recently, uh, Artem's announced their discovery at uh, just up there, right there, which is, it might be an extension to some of the stuff that we have at Green Tech. The, uh, and what's sort of driving this, I suppose, or what's coming, the picture emerging on this, of course, is a, a prospective lithium belt with a strike of some 40 odd kilometres. Uh, as a <coughs> green tech, we've got about 20 kilometres of that zone. And you can see that uh, just really defined by anybody in there, I guess it could be a corridor of hope uh, that there are discoveries turning up, um, particularly uh, within that zone now, the defined zone. Uh, well away from where uh, the initial discoveries by Azua. It's an interesting thing. This is a very big mineralized zone with more discoveries to come, I would imagine. But, uh, just looking specifically at our lithium projects, uh, there are two trends there. Um, we've got the uh, what we call Kobe, the one up to the north. Okay, we've got there's about seven and a half kilometers of strike there, and it sort of goes underground. We'll, goes under cover we're never too sure up towards our tenement boundary whether it's got anything to do with the uh, Artemis discovery a bit further on if it does I mean that zone would be you know probably 15 17 kilometers long and uh, anyway maybe <coughs> some new discoveries in that area in the coming times the uh, down the south of what we call our southern trend there there's a cluster of uh, pegmatites in that area one of the ones of particular significance is the that one we outlined is the recent uh, the uh, Osborne one, okay, and uh, also in the area of course showing the prospectivity of it is the, the soil sampling that's been done both historically and more recently, and it's outlined this zone running running through here and it's a good five or six kilometres it crosses and we've put that in there that's Raiden's soil sampling which adds to the picture. But it, it runs right through there, up in here, and uh, the pegmatites are less obvious there, but they're clearly something lithium bearing is uh, putting stuff into the soils there, and we'll be chasing that up in the near term. So we've got, in this region, we've got multiple uh, programs of works uh, approved, plus heritage surveys completed, and um, which will set us up for our planned RC drilling program in, in the near future. That's the uh, soil zone running through there. It's quite a long thing, uh, anomalous all the way from our Osman area, or the Southern Trend area right up, and go, trends up towards Kobe. So, and uh, there, uh, the uh, lithium bearing mineral here, we've confirmed in both those trends and that is to be uh, spodumene. This is just one of a section of one of the uh, chips from the Kobe trend. You can see these lozenges in here. That section's only only two to three mil, uh, centimeters across. These are lozenges. These are the spodumenes. Okay, quite clearly observable. The rest of the pale blue albites and quartz. So typical sort of albite quartz spodumene pegmatites is what we've been finding up in there. We don't fully understand them yet, but um, we continue to work on them. Just looking closely at Kobe, you can see there that you can get uh, high grade sampling all the way along the whole seven and a half kilometres. Doesn't really matter too much uh, where you are. Certainly, you know, you can get uh, a lot of dud samples through, through the pegmatite zones are actually quite wide, a couple hundred metres. And uh, but there is a, a thread right through the middle of it that runs along where you can consistently get these high grades. So you see a peak there and it's just lucky dip really of 2.3%. Uh, lithium. You can see the two drill holes we did late last year uh, through there just to see what was happening because we have there's been no drilling uh, of the pegmatites in this region previously. That's a, uh, a snapshot of the Kobe um, uh, trend. As you can see there, uh, this is a, a uh, I guess, um, a poorly outcropping version, so it's a recessive in some ways. So this thing can go along and then pop out on some of the hills. It'll outcrop out, out 
of the ground and other areas that seems to just sort of blend into the countryside but it's still there it's not not a big uh, it, it's got a, quite a strike on it but the width only varies up to maybe around six meters in places so and uh, we would dr drill a couple of drill holes in it to see what was happening at depth so we could figure out what to do next Then we look at the southern trend okay which uh, comprises a number of um, pegmatites in that area uh, most of them are, are carrying some lithium uh, but the main one is is the southern one which is we call osborne which is through here now we've now tracked that for about 700 meters and you get quite reasonable grades along them okay so um, that's uh, what we'll be looking at okay and this is the one where the, uh, we thought we were drilling, but uh, didn't quite reach it when we were, I think that's a snapshot of it. Quite broad zones, about 40 odd metres wide. Uh, this is where we drilled. We can see a couple of drill holes there. You can see that quite clearly we picked, probably, even though we thought the things were dripping to the north, it appears they weren't, and uh, we pulled up a bit short on them. And that's a snapshot there. So our mended thing, we believe the this is so lithium bearing, you know, that it's not represented by these here at all. So they were a bit further on. And similarly, the snapshot of Kobe, it's what you see in the drill hole is a reflection of what you see in the uh, surface. So forward program, we got crews up there, more mapping, soil sampling, rock chip sampling, and diamond RC. And we have all the programs worked, approved, and clearances done to let us do our work. And just quickly on the Wandu, high grade resource foundation there, some 6 million tonnes of so 1% copper and uh, within a couple of the deposits and got a typical VMS deposit, a whole string of deposits over one and a half kilometres, only 10 kilometres from an existing plant at Radio Hill. And we've been looking at existing mining license at uh, high level mining studies and we have existing mining licences. Uh, to usual disclaimer there on our presentation, and thank you very much. Oh, well done. Well done, Thomas. Green Tech Meadows. All right, we're going to Arizona now. This is speed dating with the resources industry. We're going to Arizona, where the push to advance the high-grade antler copper project is in full swing. And joining us is New World Resources MD, Michael Haynes. Welcome, Michael. Thanks very much, Chrissy, and thanks very much for Vertical Events for putting on a great show again. It's a fantastic turnout today. Um, New World's focus is firmly on developing the very, very high grade antler copper project located up in northern Arizona. We couldn't be in a better jurisdiction for mining. We're in remote, sparsely populated Arizona. Uh, and we're also redeveloping an area where there is previous production. Most recent production was in 1970. It was very high grade production that averaged 5% copper equivalent. We acquired the project four years ago in March 2020. We've now explored it, not thoroughly, but we've explored it. We've proven we can mine it. We are now permitting it. And we are now actively working to make the project much, much bigger, all of which will add value for shareholders. In terms of jurisdiction, it could not be better. As I said, sparsely populated, remote northern Arizona desert. We're about one and a half hours drive south from Las Vegas. And uh, from Las Vegas, there's an interstate highway that runs down to King, from Kingman down to the town of Yucca. And along that interstate highway also runs transcontinental rail. And we sit about 15 kilometres to the east of the town of Yucca serviced by a gravel road that leads direct to the historic mining centre. Significantly, there is mains power to within 700 metres of the old head frame, and indeed to within 200 metres where we propose building the processing plant. We have very high grade mineralisation. This allows us to build a relatively modest capex project, which will have very high margin, a modest, a good life, good initial life of 13 years, and we have applied for mine permits. So we are very near-term production and we are very actively pursuing further exploration. Just corporately, our team covers many of the disciplines that are required to bring a mining project into production. Our board has experience and expertise in law, in exploration, in geology, in finance, in metallurgy and in mining engineering. We cover the disciplines that are required to bring this into production. 
We have a market cap of about $88 million, about $8 million cash at bank at the end of December, gives us an EV of about $80 million. I think as I talk through these following slides, uh, in my view, we're heavily undervalued, and in my view, we provide excellent leverage to the copper price. Indeed, if we look back uh, to 2020 with our share price here reflected over the last four years, our share price before we even had delineated a resource on the project and before we'd completed a mining study, and we've now delineated two resources and completed two mining studies and almost completed a PFS and submitted mine permit applications. But before we'd done any of that, then our share price ran from $0.04 cents to $0.12 cents in the space of three months. And that coincided with copper running from $7,500 a tonne to $10,500 a tonne. We were very well leveraged to the copper price then, and I would argue that we're even better leveraged to the copper price today. So New World has two very clear corporate objectives. One is to bring the Antler project back into production as quickly as we practically can. And secondly, it is to continue to expand the resource base at Antler. To date, we've only drilled holes over 600 metres of strike. We have not looked outside of the Antler deposit. The Antler deposit is a VMS deposit. Where Antler is, six kilometres to the north east of it is another VMS deposit. So there's a cluster of at least two VMS deposits here. Where there's two, there's often three. Where there's three, there's often four. So there is a potential to define multiple VMS deposits in, the, in this district. With respect to mining and getting Antler back into production, then over the last three and a half years, we have been drilling at Antler. We have drilled now down to 850 vertical metres. Some of our best results have come from the deepest holes drilled underneath the historic workings. And I note on this slide, deepest hole on the project, 21 and a half metres at five and a half percent copper equivalent. And adjoining that in the South Chute, 27 metres at 7% copper equivalent and 10.7 metres at 13.7% copper equivalent. These aren't one-off high-grade holes. The deposit is consistently high-grade. Indeed, we've now drilled more than 130 holes, almost 60,000 metres, and we've declared two resources. At a 1% copper equivalent cutoff, the resource base stands at 11.4 million tonnes at 4.1% copper equivalent. Very, very high grade. Very high confidence level. 79% of that resource base is indicated. And indeed, if we eliminate all mineralisation lower grade than 2% copper equivalent, so if we apply 2% copper equivalent cutoff, only regarding higher grade mineralisation than that, we've still got 10 million tonnes at 4.5% copper equivalent. This is an extremely robust resource. It extends over 600 metres of strike down to 850 vertical, and because of the dip, we've now drilled it for over a kilometre down dip. We've taken this resource and we've run a scoping study. In May last year, we declared the results of, a, of what we call an updated scoping study that shows 93% of that resource can be captured by a mine design, seeing a 13-year mine life mining 15.5 million tonnes. Pre-production capex relatively modest, 250 million US dollars. Each tonne of ore that we move will generate revenue of about $200 US, and each tonne of ore that we mine will cost us about 100 US dollars to mine. So it's very high margin, about $100 per tonne margin, which puts us as one of the lower cost copper producers in the world. On an, on an annual basis, we will average around 33,000 tonnes of copper equivalent metal a year, half of which is copper, 40% is zinc, or the 40% of the value is in zinc, and there's, there's 8 to 9% value in the lead, silver and gold. On a copper equivalent basis, this equates to $1.70 a pound operating costs, or on a copper only basis, after our co-products, so particularly after the zinc credits, we will be producing copper for negative cash costs, negative 50 cents a pound. So over this initial operating life, we generate $3 billion worth of revenue, half of which is free cash flow at about 1.5 billion US free cash flow. Very robust NPV, very robust IRR. Because of this very strong fundamentals of developing this project, we're pushing it to production. We've submitted our longest lead time mine permit application. We submitted that in late January. We have started the mine permitting process. 
We will complete a pre-feasibility study. We've deliberately expedited the components of the pre-fees that were required for the mine permit application. We'll complete the pre-fees study later this in the first half of this year. And significantly, our commitment to developing the project is demonstrated by the recent appointment of a project development manager in country. While we go through this, we will continue to explore and make the resource base bigger. I reiterate, 100% of our drilling to date has been over purely 600 metres of strike at the Antler deposit, just drilling deeper and deeper. But there's potential to discover additional satellite VMS deposits, not only at Antler, but also in surrounding districts. We've currently got one rig operating at the Javelin project, 75 kilometres away, and in the next couple of weeks, we will mobilise a rig to drill test a very recently defined, but our highest priority exploration target, being a lookalike to, uh, to the Antler deposit sitting just 350 metres along strike to the southwest of the resource. So over four years, we have been de uh, deliberating with Newmont to acquire the land immediately to the south of us. In early December, we completed a transaction with Newmont. In early December, we mobilised a magnetics crew. In early December, we mobilised an IP crew. And several weeks ago, we announced that we'd defined a very strong coincident mag and IP anomaly 350 metres southwest of the antler deposit. It's a lookalike to the antler deposit, and we will begin drill testing this in three weeks' time. Equally, 75 kilometres away, there's an opportunity to, to um, to discover additional high-grade satellite mineralisation. There's a cluster of six past-producing VMS deposits in this VMS belt, and we have secured one of those VMSs, but we've also secured a 4,500-acre land package. We have defined an extremely strong IP anomaly that sits within a trend that's over two kilometres long that has all the hallmarks of hosting VMS mineralisation. And three weeks ago, we commenced drilling at the Javelin project. Another great opportunity to find satellite, satellite uh, mineralisation that can all be trucked to a centralised processing plant at Antler. Likewise, we have another four targets over six kilometres of strike to the northeast of Antler. So from here, we have a very busy two years ahead of us. We will continue to exploration. We will continue to grow the resource. We will complete a pre-feasibility study. We will permit this as a mining operation and we will bring the project into production. Thank you. Right well on, Michael. All right. I love this photo. Where is he? The geologist, geologist. See him leap up on the stage. He loves sticking his, his nose into rocks and anything he can tackle. This is Christopher Cairns, everyone. He's from Stabling Minerals. He is the EC and the MD and he is heavily invested in what Stavely is doing. Please make him very welcome. Thank you, Chrissy. Thanks to Stuart and Jackson, opportunity to present yet again. Um, I thought I had 15 minutes, I've only got 10, so I am gonna fly. So what do we offer that um, is unique in Stavely Minerals? Well, it's that we have big targets. We've got the Hogstone Nickel Copper Project up in the West Kimberley and the Stavely Porphyry Epithermal Project in Western Victoria. That Hawkstone Nickel project is adjacent to a recent discovery by IGO in Buxton um, at the Dogleg uh, Prospect, um, a previous discovery at Merlin, uh, both of which are about 8% nickel tenor, and I'll be going on about that quite a bit in the rest of the presentation. Stavely, high grade, high quality resource from surface, 10 million tonnes, 1.1 1 quarter percent copper and a quarter gram gold. <clears throat> Plenty of opportunity in exploration in about 800 to 1,000 square kilometres of tenure. And we recently discovered a, a Brescia pipe last year that's two kilometres long and 750 metres wide with the carbonate base metal gold type signature, and we've got one drill hole into it. So I want to do a few slides on the nickel market, and I'm sure that a few people have done this previously, but uh, in apology to Mark Twain, the demise of sulphide nickel has been grossly exaggerated. When you look at the three month uh, and three year forward pricing on the L London Metal Exchange, that's class one battery quality nickel, um, there is a contango there of about 20% over 36 months. So people who are actually buying nickel at the moment do believe that that price is going up. 
When you look at this, the red is stainless steel, it's quite static, but the demand for battery nickel in the dark blue is growing very, very significantly, and we need all the metal that the Indonesians can provide potentially, uh, as well as more. That's shown in the uh, International Energy Agency uh, emissions requirements for critical metals where there's a 23% fortfall, fortfall, shortfall, uh, not withstanding any anticipated increases in production in Indonesia. And look, we're not at historic lows in the nickel price. Emily Ann commenced production in US $6,000 a tonne nickel price. I was there. Nova Bollinger commences production into a dipping nickel price, but both were highly profitable. In fact, in 2020, IGO made $155 million net profit after tax with a no lowered nickel price than today, but with two thirds of revenue coming from Nova Bollinger. So a good quality sulfide nickel deposit will make money throughout the price cycle. And never a truer word was said from Justin Werner, who is the managing director of Nickel Industries in an AFR article recently, that Australia was in trouble because of high costs, but also because of a dearth of big recent nickel sulfide discoveries. And that is entirely true. So when you look at Nickel Industries here in the light blue in terms of the cost curve, this is from a Canaccord recent note on nickel. Uh, look at Forestania and Cosmos that are well above the dark blue line, which is the uh, Canaccord consensus 2025 price. And the dark, light blue line here is the Indonesian cost base, and here's Nova near the end of its mine life, but still underneath the cost base of the Indonesian nickel producers. And this is what we look like in terms of uh, mines that have shut down in Australia. Savannah here, looking at about 10 bucks. Forestania is still operating only because it's delivering into $32,000 US Fords, and Mincor recently shut down also about 10 bucks, and December quarterly, Nova here at $4.20. And part of the key here, and this is a really important thematic that people don't appreciate, is the tenor of mineralization as a real driver of, of uh, profit in the nickel mine. It's the tenor of the massive sulfide in percent nickel, as well as the tons per vertical meter. The Campbell nickel deposit can have the tenor, but because they're just narrow lava channels, they don't have the tons per vertical meter. Whereas in a magmatic nickel sulfide deposit, you're not talking about lava channel dimensions, you're talking about magma chamber dimensions. And that's why these types of deposits will always sit at the southern end, the low end of the cost curve. So that's why they're so attractive. So how does that relate to us? Well, we're up in the West Kimberley. It's an emerging high tenor field for nickel sulfide. It's a major regional play for independence group. The orange is applications, the purple is granted for IGO. We're right in between their tenure in that West Kimberley section. This is what it looks like, IGO blue. We're red, um, the Merlin discovery in 2015, the dogleg discovery late last year, and importantly, and I will continue to hammer on about it, um, is the tenor here in the mass of sulfide is seven and a half percent. And the dogleg prospect was described to me by a, a nickel industry luminary uh, as the most uh, recently discovered by IGO as the most significant greenfields nickel discovery in Australia this decade. So take note. 13 Ks from Merlin to dogleg. If you go 13 Ks the other way, you're right into our ground. So just a little thing about dog leg. This is a, a gravity anomaly. I've lifted this out of a Buxton announcement. Uh, there's disseminated nickel here. Uh, and uh, I've read through their um, announcements. Their discoveries are on the southern margin of gravity features where they trend more east-west. We interpret that to be the southern margin of magma chamber where there's a little bit of a depression. And as the sulfides come in, the velocity of flow into that magma chamber reduces such that the sulfides can precipitate at the base of that magma chamber. So what does that mean for us? Well, we flew the um, gravity gradiometer over our tenure. Uh, it really has set us up for uh, a big exploration push in the area. The occurrence of the uh, ruins dolerite in green here is actually much greater subsurface through this area. This is what it looks like in terms of the magma chamber. 
and it compares to the magma chamber at Nova. Uh, our magma chamber is about 20 k's, theirs was about 75. But the discovery intercept at Nova was uh, four meters at almost 4% nickel and 1.5% copper. The discovery intercept at Dog Lake for the mass of sulfide was 7.5% nickel, and as I say, the tenor of these deposits is critical to the profitability. This is how they form, come up through a feeder dike into a magma chamber, the sulfides just fall out right to the bottom, just the same as Norilsk and Voisy's Bay. So what do we see in our, our magma chamber? Well, what we're seeing is, we think that the discovery zone at Voisy's Bay in a dike was similar to a dog's leg, but the, the eastern deeps, it's gonna be the mining for the next 15 years for Inco, this looks like that magma chamber to us. So we've got a $220,000 WA government uh, uh, funding, co-funding for an 800 meter deep hole to test this concept. So here we go, we just walked through this large gravity high, interpreted magma chamber at depth, feeder dikes and target zones at the base. This is what it looks like. The green lines faint uh, are a very major EM program. Stavely, I'm just going to talk through this very quickly. Good quality resource. Um, it's uh, well drilled, 60 odd percent in the indicated category. We think that that belongs in a local process plant and we're working towards doing a study on production. Regional porphyry targets based on a porphyry uh, epithermal zonation model of GEOCAM. Two targets, uh, S2 and S3 here, uh, very similar uh, gravity lows to known uh, deposits like the Cayley load here and other known prospects. So very high confidence in that. And the work program, really, uh, we're really gearing up for that Hawkstone Kimberley program. We think this is an absolute cracker of an opportunity, a long strike of known mineralization, high tenor, uh, very fertile environment. And we're in the, the, the best seat in the house other than independence. We've been smashed. Uh, therein lies the opportunity. Um, I think that we're very undervalued, quality copper resource, quality nickel op uh, exploration opportunity. And I think markets have got it wrong on nickel. They, they've just read the front page of the AFR and they said, okay, well, that's it. We, we know everything we need to know about nickel, but it's not true. Okay, the load's a quality resource. It needs a home in a local processing. And they're big targets. So thank you very much for your attention. Well done, Chris Cairns. I loved your um, interpretation on slide 13. That shows your passion as a geologist. I loved it. All right. We've got some conference virgins joining us up on stage now. Newly minted, less than a month old. And this fellow here with a big smile on his face is Graham Sloan. He is their MD. Now, he is an engineer, so he loves numbers. And I was having a chat with him before, and he's got some numbers that excited him a whole heap today, and I know he's going to share them with you. Would you please make him very welcome? We are talking Carly Metals. Thank you very much, and uh, to listening to the Kelly story, and thank you to uh, the organisers of uh, RIU and to you, Christy, for, for putting on a great event. So listen, uh, a little bit before I uh, begin the presentation, just on the formation of Kelly. Kelly Metals was formed um, from the spin out of lithium assets of TSX listed Corora resources and ASX listed uh, Kalamazoo resources. So the journey has been uh, commenced uh, in uh, early 23 um, and we listed on the uh, ASX um, in January the 5th of this year. So uh, the IPO opened and closed very quickly in a matter of hours, heavily oversubscribed. We raised our full $15 million. Uh, and could have done that several times over. Um, we have the distinction being the first IPO on the, uh, on the ASX for 2024. As I said before, on a number of occasions, if you had have asked me six months ago whether this was the best time to, uh, to list, I probably would have said no, but it just goes to show if you have the right assets then you'll certainly get the right interest. Um, disclaimer, obviously, so if you t urge you to read, um, there's some forward-looking statements in here. So what makes Kelly stand out from all the rest? Um, well, we have this massive land position of just under 4,000 square kilometres in, in what we believe is uh, uh, the largest lithium, hard rock lithium land package in Australia, uh, and certainly we measure up on the global standard as well. 
Two of our three projects um, are in probably the hottest uh, lithium uh, provinces in Western Australia, or Australia if you like, one in the Pilbara and one down on the eastern Yilgar and what we call the Higginsville. Our third project is well over east on the emerging lithium province in the Lachlan Fold Belt. As I said, uh, hugely successful IPO, raised 15, um, fully funded for the next two years. Uh, we can now focus very, very much on our, on our exploration activities. Um, several key investors came on board um, pre and post the IPO, including Mineral Resources that came on to the, to the register at 14%. Um, we also have a very strategic um, a partnership or joint venture with SQM. Um, they have a, a, the right to earn 70% on two of our projects in the Pilbara um, by spending $12 million over four years. So, uh, and we certainly have the team. We have a great team and I'll talk a bit more about that as we go on. As I said, a bit on the corporate structure itself, IPO 25 cents listing price. Uh, gave us a market cap at listing of 36, uh, total shares on issue 144. We currently sit around 40 cents, um, which gives us a market cap around that 60 odd million uh, dollars, uh, enterprise value of 43. Major shareholders, Corora with 22%, Kalamazoo Resources with 20, and as I said, Mineral Resources sit there with 14, Wabello uh, with 4.9. Board and management, on a fully diluted basis, that's somewhere in the order of 11%, and our top 20, just under 71% uh, of the register. Board, very strong, uh, led by Luke Greiner, the chairman. Uh, Luke is well known in the industry and instrumental in putting the Cali uh, transaction together. Paul Adams, uh, non-exec director, a geologist uh, of renown, and probably most recently known for his uh, efforts in the Ironman in Bunbury, where he was very credible and up there with the, with, the, with the leaders. The trouble is, I think Luke is now thinks the board should be in that Ironman competition, and you can see from the physique that I'd fit in really well. Um, and uh, the only thing is, I'd, I said to, to, to Luke that um, if we were to sort of go in that, it would need to be a tag team. We'll do sort of 100 metre dashes, but even I think a 100 metre dash might be a bit far for us. But John Letty, also an Ironman. I'm not sure what the Ironman is to do with a, a Cali exploration lithium company, but um, or exploration company, but um, they sit there on the board. John Letty, um, legal counsel, M&A, um, uh, very, very strong in and around corporate affairs. Simon Coyle, um, in and around, he's our operations guy, previous general manager of operations of Pilgongora. Um, and the important part of our team is our, our management team, and that's led by Stuart Peterson as general manager of, um, of geology. He has a good tight-knit uh, exploration team and, uh, and two other guys working alongside him. And you'll see the results of that uh, when I show you a bit further on. Rounding out there is Nick Matters, our, our company secretary, and Sylvia Moore. Morton is our CFO. Three major projects, uh, Higginsville, Pilbara, and the Lachlan Fold Belt. Um, that the, uh, the one on the left there, you'll see it's, it's a big area, the Higginsville area, it's some 1,500 square kilometres. We had to break it up into eight separate areas to be able to make exploration more efficient. We currently uh, are focusing, sorry, go back. We're currently focusing on uh, the what we call the Spargaville project up there, and then also the the Widgimiltha project right there. Um, surrounding that tenement package is any number of, of uh, uh, advanced lithium projects, and also two operating lithium mines in Mount Marion to the north, and Bald Hill to the east of those. Down south we have uh, the Bulldania project, and then to the west we have uh, uh, essential minerals. Uh, Pioneer Dome. We sit dead smack in the middle of that um, and, and we're working, as I said, on those two project areas. Pilbara, uh, you'll see in the middle diagram there, um, the uh, Doms Hill, Pear Creek and down here is Marble Bar Tenement. We're not far from Port Hedland, as someone else has showed earlier on in the piece, we're about an hour's drive on the sealed road 
And from Dom's Hill, it's about an hour and a half to Marble Bar. Just to the southwest of Dom's Hill is the Pilgrim Gora uh, operation, and further, just to further southwest of that again, is uh, is the Wajana deposit. Lachlan Fold Belt is two project areas: Jinjalik and Talangata. Um, a big area, 2,000 square kilometres, and I'll speak more a little bit on the, on the next couple of slides. At uh, Higginsville, or the Eastern Yilgarn, if you like, and our Spargaville project, um, we've been, some of the work that's been done to date is around field work, mapping of these, uh, other, any number of uh, outcropping pegmatites there. We reported uh, rock chip samples of highs of 3.69%. Um, this morning we released uh, uh, the results of the most recent work out there, stage one soils and also some further rock chip samples. You can see from there some big numbers, plus 5% from rock chips and a very large uh, uh, anomaly there you see over there on the right hand side of the diagram, extending some two kilometres in length and, and, and really sort of quite wide there. There's a third uh, anomaly sitting over to the west over there. Um, that's called Parker Grub. It looks small at the moment, and that's only because we've put a couple of lines of soils across there. And again, if you can look to the bottom of that, you can see some good rock chip samples in excess of 2%. So this area certainly looking good for us, um, at not just the, the, the strike length of that uh, anomaly, but also the width of that, what we're talking about. Given the results of that, we've upgraded our stage two and stage three soils program to cover more of that ground. And I'm certainly looking forward to some of the results coming out of that. And as I said, some good work from our exploration team led by uh, Stuart and Jeremy. Um, at Widgie Milther, again, um, this is more recent results come out of here. Again, part of the release, um, big results, uh, 900 metres long. Um, and you can see the numbers there. Mount Henry, early days, um, but in excess of 1% there as far as rock chips. Pilbara, land of the giants, it's the big ones up here. That's what we're looking for. That's why uh, SQM are up there as well. Um, Lachlan Fold Belt, new, um, big area, 2,000 square kilometres up there. Um, and again, lots of work been done and we'll be reporting on some work, uh, further work as, as time goes on. So in finishing, um, look, I will say that uh, we have that massive land position. If you want to take something away, it's the man, land position we have. We sit alongside some really world-class major lithium mines. We have some very real targets there. We have the funds, we have the team, and as you can see from the recent announcements, we're getting the results. Very quickly before I go, um, just to thank our, I, I need to thank our uh, Cali exploration team. They've done a great job. Virgin. Off, off you get Virgin. Off. Go. Off you get Virgin. <laughs> well done. Good first show. Brilliant first show. Lots of excitement. All right. You've only got 10 minutes. This man is not a Virgin. Alex Passmore, Aura Gold. He's been very excited lately. They've been doing a lot of exploration in 2023 and just recently the reports are in. So he'll have some numbers to share with us once he gets his Dubalak into his thingamabob. Success? Excellent. Make Alex Passmore very welcome, everyone. Okay. So um, I've got it on my Green. Yes, it's come through. Great. So thank you, Chrissy. Uh, pleasure to be presenting at the ROU conference once again. So Aura Gold uh, is an advanced gold explorer based in Western Australia. Uh, we have a fairly simple investment thesis. We're, um, we're located in the Murchison Gold District, a uh, prolific uh, gold belt in Western Australia, 35 million ounces of past production and, and resources uh, sitting there, uh, and we own 100% of our projects, uh, which sit on granted mining leases with native title agreements in place. We've recently uh, published a mineral resource at our flagship project, Crown Prince, of 240,000 ounces at 4.1 grams per tonne. This is a shallow resource, um, it starts at surface and, and looks very much like a, a highly profitable open pit to us. There's Plenty of resource upside with that resource open uh, down down deep in a long strike. So from here, uh, we, we will um, we'll, we're now understanding and de-risking the project, looking at geotechnical aspects, metallurgy, hydrogeology, and things like that. 
In terms of uh, the corporate overview for Aura, uh, we're capped at around $35 million today, uh, have 4.1 million in cash, uh, which gets us to where we need to be in terms of drilling and, and, and those, uh, those technical work streams that I, was, uh, that I mentioned. We, we're well supported by our, uh, our shareholders. We've been building out the institutional um, part of our register and, and that, that will continue on. So where is the project? The Garden Gully Gold project is a substantial tenement package uh, in the Mika Thara, just to the north of Mika Thara. Uh, we, um, we are focused on the Abernathy Shear Zone, which is um, shown uh, in red on that slide. So the Abernathy Shear Zone is a, a, about a 20 kilometre long shear zone with gold occurrences all the way along it. Our flagship project is Crown Prince, which sits here. So now I'm just going to um, go through a bit of a fly through so you can get a regional uh, understanding of, of the Garden Gully Gold project. So here we have uh, some of the nearby neighbours uh, and you can see our tenement package outlined in, in yellow. So Aura Gold uh, in, in the yellow, you can't, uh, obviously the Western Australian landscape fairly flat uh, and, and just showing the major drainage systems there. Uh, we, we're, um, we're, our near neighbours are Mika Minerals, uh, Great Boulder, West Gold Resources and, and Odyssey Minerals, Odyssey. So looking, uh, looking at the southern end of the belt, we have Odyssey with their Takanara project, West Gold uh, and the Q Gold operations. Then coming further north, we have West Gold and Mika Thara Gold operations, Great Boulder with their Side Well project. And then flipping over to the other side of the Great Northern Highway, we have, uh, we have the Garden Gully Gold Project and the Crown Prince Prospect sitting in the middle. It's just worthwhile noting uh, while, while um, we're looking at this view, how close we are to Mika Thara and how um, well we're serviced by, by those roads and that infrastructure. So uh, we're around uh, 20 kilometres uh, to the north of Mika Thara along, along a um, public road that, that could service um, a, a whole road, um, you know, should we look to take that or anywhere else. So now we're just going to zoom into the uh, the Crown Prince Prospect itself. <clears throat> this is um, it's, it sits adjacent to the Garden Gully drainage system. You can see here uh, our recent drilling. Uh, so the the uh, assays shown in yellow there are anything above one gram, uh, with the, with the high grade assays being uh, being um, shown there red ten grams. So this is the uh, recent resource that we published. Um, I'm just going to um, show you a different perspective. So you can see here several loads um, dipping down to the south uh, east of the project. Uh, you can see um, that, that this sort of shape fits nicely into, a, into an open pit um, with the resource coming, um, coming from surface. A high proportion of our resources in the indicated category, category around 68%. Uh, and as we grow the resource, will of course be, um, be careful to, um, to maintain a high ratio of indicated. So just uh, now looking at some grades, so this is uh, anything above one gram uh, in, in terms of the block model. Uh, so um, once again, starting from surface, you can see, um, you can see some of the high grades, um, you know, plenty of three and five type gram areas, um, which would fit into an open pit. Now looking at a little bit of geology, uh, so this is what the rocks look like uh, from a shallow uh, high-grade intercept. So here I've shown uh, hole number 461, which is returned 33 metres at 24 grams per tonne from 57 metres. And this is uh, one of the early shallow intercepts at our uh, recent discovery, the southeastern zone. Uh, so we can see here oxidised uh, rocks, but with you know gold load hosted in quartz veins. So if I can just zoom out and show you where that um, intercept comes from. So fairly shallow in, the, in, in terms of the overall system. Now looking at what the mineralisation looks like deeper down. So we're in the fresh rock here, we're in dolerite, uh, one of the deepest intersections at the deposit, uh, hole number, uh, diamond hole number 110, uh, eight metres at 22 grams from 259 metres. So we can see competent dolerite uh, and, uh, and an and a altered dolerite quartz vein hosted, uh, hosted ore body. So looking along strike, what we're seeing is some of that shallow oxide gold extending to the, uh, extending to the right hand side of this screen, which is to the northeast. Uh, and you know, we're drilling under that uh, material now. So that, that hit that I'm highlighting there is four metres at 15 grams. So there has been um, a small amount of 
uh, historical mining done here. So between 1905 and 1915, there was a um, there was a mine, um, which you can see the workings um, just in that location on this slide. So that they extend down to around 90 metres, uh, just to give you a sense of scale. So just zooming in on that and showing you sort of what that looks like. So small scale, but very high grade mining. So now stepping back to, um, to some of the highlights of, of the Crown Prince prospect. So the headline results that the recent drilling has put out are, are pretty sensational. So 40 metres at 16 grams from 75 metres, 17 at 12 and a half grams from 96 metres, 16 at 37 grams from 146 metres, just, just to name a few of the highlights. So, you know, it, it's a high grade ore body, good metallurgy, uh, and we expect to be, um, to be very robust economics. So this is a cross section of that southeastern zone, which is a, a new discovery uh, made this year. Uh, dips down to the southeast uh, and, and is open at depth, and we're, we're drilling the extensions of that now. So just a quick look at what the mineralisation looks like at, at depth. So clean metallurgy, uh, sheer dolerite, quartz vein, uh, quartz carbonate alteration. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're liking what we're seeing in terms of uh, in terms of the metallurgy and, and the continuity. So just um, looking at the resource that we published, so 4.1 gram average grade, 240,000 ounces, but importantly, the southeastern zone, 164,000 ounces at over 5.2 grams. So another perspective diagram of, of what that zone looks like, and it looks like we've got another emerging zone over uh, in the northeast called the Crown Prince East Zone. Open uh, along strike and at depth. And so what are we doing uh, for the coming six months? Well, we're drilling along strike and down dip. Uh, we particularly see an opportunity to add ounces um, below the 100 metre mark. Uh, so we see an average uh, uh, ounce endowment of about 1250 per vertical metre, uh, and, th and that seems to be continuous. There's a super chain enrichment at around the 10 metre mark uh, where we get up to 3000 ounces per vertical metre, which, which obviously helps in an open pit sense. So from here, build the project to scale. Uh, 240,000 ounces is, is sounds like a modest number, um, although if that's all in an open pit and it's you know above four grams, well, to us they're very you know they're very mineable and uh, ounces and um, very valuable ounces. So we'll be advancing our technical programs uh, and looking at what else we can we can put into that pit. Thank you. Thank you. Nice quick finish there, Alex Passmore. I like the wrap up. Well done. All right. Bright Star Resources is next up on stage. They're described as having one of the cheapest and quickest pathways to cash generation of any of their ASX listed gold development peers. And our guide to Bright Star today is Alex Rivero. Please make him welcome. Thanks, Chrissy, and thanks to everyone at RAU and Vertical Events for this great conference and for the ability for Bright Star to participate. So I thought I'd start off today with something a little bit different, and we're just going to show a, a video that we had made last year, really showcasing the projects between the Menzies and Laverton we project are areas. We Resources, owner of the Laverton and Menzies Gold Projects, with a chalk resource of over 1 million ounces, located here in the eastern goldfields of Western Australia. We've just commenced mining at the Silkirk Open Pit, one of the high grade deposits we have at our Menzies Gold Project. All of Bright Star's mineral resources at Menzies and Laverton are located on granted mining leases, which paves the way for future gold production at current record high gold prices. Menzies is a historic high grade gold field with a total mineral endowment of over 1.3 million ounces of gold. The Andaga deposit at Menzies is a key underground opportunity for Bright Star and was historically mined 600 metres below surface. Welcome to Cork Truel, part of Bright Star's Laverton Gold Project. With a mineral resource of over 300,000 ounces, Cork Truel is a key focus area for us as we look to restart mining operations in Laverton. We're actively exploring across both our Menzies and Laverton Gold Projects 
Here we are partway through a four and a half thousand meter drilling program at Corktree Well at our Labrador project. The start processing plant located south of Laverton was last run in 2012. Currently on care and maintenance, this infrastructure has a replacement value of between $50 and $100 million. The recently released scoping study envisaged the expansion and refurbishment of this infrastructure. With everything going on, it's a great time to get involved with us and our bright future. There we go. So thanks for sitting through that. Uh, Dean and I won't be quitting our day jobs anytime soon. Uh, just jumping into the, the project overview, um, as mentioned in the video, we do have a mineral endowment uh, resource over 1 million ounces split between our Menzies and Laverton gold projects uh, located here and here. We are fortunate to have excellent infrastructure across both project areas. Uh, Menzies is located immediately on the, uh, the Goldfields Highway. Uh, as you saw in the video, we're currently mining at the moment, so we're, we're trucking high grade dirt from our Silkirk deposit up to Gualia, uh, Genesis is mill up in, uh, in Leonora currently at the moment. Um, similarly, up in Laverton, you know, we've got an excellent road network and hall network between our project areas, linking us, uh, the resource areas, with the processing facility that we do have. Uh, late last year, we released a scoping study into the restart of operations. What that showed was a production profile of uh, just over 320,000 ounces mined over eight years, so a uh, 40,000 ounce production profile per annum. Um, for us, it really showed that this project works, the economics were fantastic. Really a lot of that is, is, uh, is underpinned by the low capital cost, something that we were really focused on in this capital environment, both from a debt and equity perspective. You know, keeping that capex low was, was incredibly important. So for a pre-production capital of $22 million, we can deliver at current spot an MPV of over $150 million and an IRR of 138%. So excellent uh, financial metrics. Uh, the scoping study showed uh, around about a third of our ounces converting to what might be mining inventory in due, to, in due course. What we're looking at at the moment is growing both the resource as a headline number and also increasing that conversion rate just to increase the mine life and also the production profile per annum. Uh, we do have mining operations underway at the moment in Menzies under a joint venture scenario. What we're assessing uh, at the moment is, is the opportunity for additional uh, small scale mining opportunities at Menzies and toll milling through one of the mills in the district, either Paddington or Gwali or one of the other ones, to really continue to generate uh, organic free cash so that we're less reliant on equity capital markets. We can put that cash flow into more drilling and, and development studies. Just quickly on the corporate overview, we are a circa $30 million market cap at the moment. Uh, at the end of the December quarter, we had $4.8 million in the bank. Uh, that is excluding any of the funds from the Selkirk mining. So, you know, adding those funds on, which we should receive in the next month or two. Uh, you know, we're really well funded for, for drilling and, and the development stage that we're in. Um, enterprise value of circa $25, $26 million. That gives us a, an EV in per ounce in the ground of $25 per ounce, something that we think is you know, relatively undemanding in the current market. Uh, top 50 shareholders own about half the company. Uh, we've had two uh, Sydney-based research uh, brokers initiate research on us recently, which is available on our website. Just looking backwards for a moment, looking at 2023, really it was underpinned by the merger we did with King West Resources. That saw the combination of the two project areas. It enabled us to refresh the board and the executive and the management team. Throughout the year, we raised $10 million of equity capital. That enabled us to significantly institutionalise the register and, and strengthen what we do have. Now, I think the institutional ownership a year ago was less than 1%, and now it's about 20%. We managed to do two deals with, uh, with our DAIA and DEVEX. We did a, a, a tenement swap with our DAIA to pick up additional tenure in Menzies. We did a joint venture with DEVEX where they're farming into a nickel project, a non-core project of ours. Uh, we were able to, to do two deals where we think is really sensible deployment of our balance sheet. We are purchasing secondhand equipment, both a mining camp and, and carbon and leach tanks for our plant. You know, both of those purchases were at significant discounts to replacement costs. So fast tracking development and, and you know, keeping the capex as low as possible. Operationally, we drilled over 24,000 metres across the two project areas. We commenced mining. We had multiple resource upgrades last year. Released that, uh, that scoping study in September, which showed the excellent economics, uh, and which really underpinned, I suppose, launching strain to pre-feasibility study that's underway. Uh, and we commenced diamond drilling uh, recently. 
Um, the presentation we released today is a lot more wholesome than this, so I'll, I'll fly through some of these numbers, but please go through it in your own time. What I will call out is, is really the sensitivity table here, and, and this is essentially the gold price assumptions for our scoping study. We assume 2,900, uh, and that's what all these financials are, are based on. And you can see the delta or the increase, just the gold price has you know, essentially a 50% increase in the MPV, taking it from 2,900 to, to current spot. Um, what that means and what that delivers for us is, is what we're looking at as sector leading return on investment. And that's for me best characterised as, as the project MPV over the pre-production capital. So every dollar we spend to build this, how many dollars do we get back? And there's peer comps in the slides and then you look around the market, what, what that'll show is, is that number based on 2900 is, is exceptional for the explorer and the developer space and really in line with a few of the recent developments that you've seen in the market. Uh, this is just a quick snapshot of the mining. We've been mining for over six months. That actually completes this month uh, and it gets toll treated through Gualia in March. We are looking at other opportunities in Menzies, looking to do so. Um, we released, recently released some drill results for the link zone. We see that as a real opportunity for a potential small scale mining operation to continue to generate organic funding for us to, to drill and, and explore. Uh, I'll skip over that slide. It is in the presentation. That's just a summary of the production profile. I'll quickly touch on, I suppose, the forward timetable and a bit of a Gantt chart. So this is split between drilling uh, and project development hurdles. Looking at the, uh, the resource definition drilling work, that's all underway and expected to continue for most of the year, both with diamond and RC drilling. We do have sampling and mapping going on at Menzies at the moment. So really looking to explore across both project areas, as I said, adding more ounces and trying to bring more ounces into measured indicated categories and into mining inventory. From a project perspective, uh, development, we've got a pre-feasibility study underway that we're due for completion uh, in early Q3. And, and we'd like to be in a position at the start of next year, call it 12 months from now, to have both project areas fully permitted, uh, a definitive feasibility study completed, and be making FID and be in production next year. Just lastly, before Chrissy yells at me, uh, this is an announcement we put out today on some diamond drilling that we did at Cork Tree Well. So this is the deposit up at Laverton that's currently got a resource of 300,000 ounces. This is the first diamond hole that's been put into it. Um, in short, there's nothing short of exceptional. Uh, the call out is, is just under 35 metres at 7.9 grams per tonne. Uh, we drilled this hole for metallurgical test work purpose. So it was into an area we knew there was mineralisation, but even you know, that grade exceeded all our expectations. Visible gold throughout the core was, uh, was excellent to see. We've got uh, another 18 holes pending from that particular program. So um, thank you very much for having me. Well done, Mr. Rivera. All right. This is an interesting one. If you've got shares in this company, you would have been paid some money this year, which would be interesting. Uh, we are, oh, sorry, we've got Graham McGarry uh, joining us on stage. Graham is the managing director of Beacon Minerals. Graham, I'll let you have your entire 10 minutes. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Oops. You're good. Green light? Yep, all good. Good to go. Green button. Okay. Should it stand it? No, we're not getting it. Here we are. Sorry, Chrissy. So a standard disclaimer, we're an ASX listed company. Uh, so a standard disclaimer covering those uh, parts of the industry that we are involved in. Uh, corporate snapshot, probably the key issue is our cash position. Uh, sorry. Key issue is our cash position, uh, $14 million at the end of December, plus 1,900 ounces in transit, partly because of the uh, End of the end of the calendar year, uh, we have some debt attached to mining equipment. We also had some forward my, small forward gold contracts, which we've closed out almost uh, half of them at a profit and uh, at a surplus above our realised price. So that's been a good result for us. It also underpinned uh, the dividend that we paid in December, guaranteed that we ha had a short income. Performance highlights really are a standard business. The head grade is low, but the mining costs are low because of the low strip ratio. Recovered grade uh, is high percentage-wise. Uh, steady gold production over quite a period of time now. The average gold sales price there is fairly stable, but increasing across the period of time. 
Uh, we don't re we report the average uh, gold price that we receive from the Perth Mint, and then we separately show the uh, hedging gains that we've made. They're modest, but they have underpinned the income. Uh, one of the costs in there is the pre-strip panel cost for McPherson's. You'll see that in, in this December quarter, it's $454 an ounce. Um, we commenced the mining there in uh, middle of October, and by the end of January, the, the project's well advanced, and you'll see that a bit later. We support the communities that we operate in, uh, particularly in Coolgardie and also in Kalgoorlie. Uh, we do... Uh, provide an amount of $100,000 a year spread across the quarters to support those communities. It's very important that uh, they're a part of our business. We try to recruit both in Coolgardie and in Kalgoorlie. Uh, we have a degree of success, but fly and fly out is a part of the industry that we're involved in. And there is uh, only way that we can get our, our workforce up to 80 direct employees. Plus we have uh, contractors involved that travel from various areas. The plant will complete its fifth year in August of this year. Uh, the plant is uh, very well regarded in the industry. It's compact. It's rated uh, last year we did do over 800,000 tonne a year. This year we, uh, we will probably be around the $800,000 a year, uh, 800,000 tonne a year. We won't go over that, we don't think, as we get the harder ore comes in from McPherson for award. In this uh, coming year, we will be, uh, the balance of this year, we will be milling uh, all stocks that we've accumulated over the year uh, from the from, from the low grade or ultimately left over from mining lost dog. So we see a stable, stable uh, production uh, and costs that have already been incurred turned into dollars. Resources and reserves uh, are from last year, and that is a standard uh, uh, document we put out before the end of the financial year. We'll do that again this year. There is a focus on increasing the reserves. Uh, we believe that ultimately when we complete the Lady Ida transaction and with the import of Mount Dimer and the drilling at Mount Dimer, those uh, numbers will improve. And that is important. The bottom line is that at the end of June last year, we had 140,000 ounces in reserves. So that provides a stable platform for the next four years without the addition of the other projects. Mining at the McPherson's project uh, has been going since October, as I mentioned. Uh, we're, this uh, shot is looking from the northeast to the uh, southwest. You can see where the previous mining operators, the uh, prospectors, have gouged out ore both in the uh, northern one, which is the one closest to us, uh, which is McPherson's, and the southern one, which is ACAP. So we have just commenced some drilling and blasting. You see that on the left hand side of the slide, and uh, that is going well with a, a Calgary based contractor by, Australian, by the name of Australian Service Drilling. So there's quite a crew of people there. We are just working day shift at the moment, uh, but we will move to a sec uh, second shift later in uh, in March, and that will improve. Uh, already we're ahead of budget in terms of material moved. And that's important to us as we try and speed up the project and complete it by late next year. We have our own equipment. We do our own owner mining. We're using Komatsu equipment. Uh, we use two fleets at the moment. There's sufficient room within the pit for us to operate two sets of equipment. That may not be always, always the case, but certainly will be for, for the majority of this calendar year. Uh, so some of the equipment's new, some of it is secondhand. It was acquired from Goldfields last year with a view to putting it in into the McPherson's project. Our exploration, we are uh, focused a little bit more on exploration. There is uh, exploration to be undertaken at, at McPherson's in terms of uh, uh, underground ore reserves and at Tyco, which we've undertaken some drilling and reported those results, standard type results for type of deposit in that Kilgardi area. The Enigma anomaly is one of our targets for this year, and we expect to be drilling that in the second quarter of this year. It's located in that slide, uh, in the middle of the slide. Uh, it has a good opportunity for us to extend all reserve in the immediate McPherson's ACAP area. So we're optimistic about that drilling. Uh, probably uh, May, June, we'll be undertaking that drilling. 
The later you are what we call acquisition A uh, is where we acquired four exploration licenses from Orabanda Mining. We will be uh, drilling up there very shortly at a prospect called the Mon Monitor Prospect. That'll be the first of several prospects to be drilled within that tenement package of four exploration licenses. Both Big Cat and Black Cat South are lower down in our priority at the moment. They're within our own uh, mining list package, so there's not a lot of pressure on us to, to explore those. Uh, they've had some work, uh, but there'll be more work to be done. At Gecko, the transaction was completed last year, and uh, we have defined from the previous data uh, resources and reserves. We do have, a, have had a delay with the miscellaneous licence. The key to this, it makes a lot of water, and we're probably the, the logical place to uh, have the water taken to, and it's probably the only place under the current views of the mines department. So we need that miscellaneous licence in place before we can go and mine there, but we believe that'll be complete by the end of March. Mount Dimer is a project we acquired and completed the transaction late last year. Uh, it was a high grade pit discovered, initially dis discovered by Western Mining back in the 70s and 80s, mined by Tectonic. They mined uh, 125,000 ounces of high grade ore. We're very excited about the potential here and we start drilling in about three weeks time and there'll be a single phase of drilling through March and we'll be able to hopefully release those results at the end of April. But it's a, a very high grade uh, project and that will provide us with additional ore. Again, the shot it shows the drilling, the proposed drilling, I think it's 51 holes, 57 holes for just under 6,000 metres. Uh, we'll end up with some very exciting numbers beneath the lightning pit and we'll also extend the golden slipper deposit that's had some partial mining on it. And that's uh, a long section of, of the drilling. Uh, lightning is uh, undeveloped and will generate some very good numbers. Lady Ida acquisition B is unfortunately there been a lengthy delay to get to this point, but we'll go to shareholders hopefully by, by May, June, and uh, that will significantly, if it is passed by shareholders, significantly add to the reserves and resources of, of the company. We do uh, focus on shareholder returns. We have paid 40, $41 million in dividends since uh, financial year 2021. So that is important to us. We have an expiration budget for this year. We also are involved in time or less than have been there since 2016. So. We just need to tidy up some legals here with the uh, with the Murak Ray, which is the government entity, which will own 20% free carriage interest to final feasibility. That will be tied up in the next two or three weeks. Thank you. Well done. Thank you very much, Graham, for that. My number plates for my car are Boulder number plates, BD500. Good number plates. They confuse everyone when I drive around. I'm from Kalgoorlie. It's not right to have bold and number plates, but yet I do. There you go. Now, I'm going to do my very best impersonation right now of a gentleman by the name of Mark Williams. He has a small goatee. He's a little bit larger than me and takes up a bit more space. But the last time I spoke to him, he was in the back of a cab rushing between two different jobs, and he just made a very big announcement. So if you've been following Red 5's uh, progression over the last 12 months, you will have known that there's been some, uh, some developments for them. So this is a note that he sent to me to read out to all of you for today. To all of the delegates of the RIU Explorers Conference for 2024, as I'm sure most attendees will be aware, Red5 has recently announced a proposed merger of equals with fellow Western Australian gold miner Silver Lake Resources. The transaction is set to create a diversified mid-tier gold company with annual gold production of 445,000 ounces per annum a pro forma market capitalization of over Australian 2 billion and a strong balance sheet to pursue growth. Full details of the transaction were announced to the market on the 5th of February, along with an investor presentation that details the key highlights of the merger to shareholders in both companies. Due to a hectic travel and marketing schedule following this transaction, I'm very sorry that I'm personally unable to present at this year's Explorance Conference on behalf of Red5. We extend our apologies to the organisers and all of the attendees. However, senior members of our geology team, are there any of you in the room at the moment? Have you all raced out to their booths? They're at the booth at the moment. 
So there are senior members of Red 5's geology team available at the Red 5 booth, and I look forward to catching up with delegates throughout the course of the conference. Please ask them any question that you would like. We take this opportunity to wish everyone a very successful conference and look forward to participating in future RAU events following the completion of this transaction. Enjoy your afternoon tea, Mark Williams. And with that, I will see you all back here in quarter of an hour. Thank you, everyone.